Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! What would the objective of an attack on Syria be, and how does that serve the interests of the American people? Uh, I don't want to talk about a specific attack that is not yet in the offing, knowing that these are decisions, this would be pre-decisional. As President Trump tweets, an attack on Syria over an alleged chemical weapons attack could take place very soon or not so soon at all, Defense Secretary James Mattis says the U.S. is still investigating. Meanwhile, Syrian government forces have taken full control of the Damascus suburb of eastern Ghouta in a major victory for President Bashar al-Assad, where the U.N. says 100,000 people are in desperate need of food, water and medicine. Then, President Trump campaigned against the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The Trans-Pacific Partnership is another disaster done and pushed by special interests who want to rape our country, just a continuing rape of our country. That's what it is, too. It's a harsh word. It's a rape of our country. Now, in an unexpected reversal, Trump told a group of state lawmakers he wants the U.S. to rejoin the controversial massive trade agreement. We'll get response from Lori Wallach, director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch. Finally, as nearly four evictions are filed in the United States every minute, we turn to look at a new project called the Eviction Lab. Affordable housing has become so deep and entrenched in our low-income communities today that eviction, instead of being rare, has become ordinary. The prevalence of eviction, how common it is in low-income communities, is leaving a deep and jagged scar on the next generation. Speak with Matthew Desmond, Princeton professor of sociology, author of the Pulitzer Prize-winning book Evicted, Poverty and Profit in the American City. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Syrian government forces have taken full control of the Damascus suburb of eastern Ghouta in a major victory for President Bashar al-Assad. The capture of eastern Ghouta followed a Russian broker deal that saw the last remaining rebel fighters granted safe passage to a rebel-held area in northern Syria. Human rights groups estimate some 1,700 civilians were killed in heavy fighting after Syrian forces, backed by Russia, launched an offensive on eastern Ghouta in February. The United Nations says at least 100,000 people in Douma remain low on food, water and medicine, and are in desperate need of help. Eastern Ghouta's fall comes as the U.N. Security Council is set to meet in an emergency session today over the growing prospect of a war between Russia and the U.S. after President Trump threatened U.S. strikes in response to an alleged chemical weapons attack in Douma last Saturday. This is Russia's U.N. Ambassador, Vasily Nibenza. The immediate priority is to avert the danger of war. Uh, Look, uh, we cannot exclude any possibilities, unfortunately, because we saw, we saw messages that are coming from Washington. Uh, they were very bellicose. Uh, uh, they know we are there. I hope, uh, I, I, I wish there was a dialogue at, uh, through appropriate channels on this to avert any, any, dangerous, uh, any dangerous development. Those comments came as the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, said Russia has evidence that Saturday's alleged chemical attack in Duma was fabricated. French President Emmanuel Macron has said he has proof Syria's government carried out the attack. And NBC News cited two unnamed U.S. officials who said blood and urine samples taken from a victim and smuggled out of Duma show signs of poisoning from a nerve agent and chlorine gas. On Capitol Hill, Defense Secretary James Mattis said the U.S. is still investigating. This is Mattis being questioned by Hawaii Democratic Congress member Tulsi Gabbard. What would the objective of an attack on Syria be, and how does that serve the interests of the American people? Uh, I don't want to talk about a specific attack that is not yet in the offing, knowing that we, these are decisions. This would be pre-decisional. Again, the president has not made that decision.
We'll have more on the crisis in Syria after headlines with Yazan al Sadi, Syrian Canadian writer and researcher. The Senate convened a confirmation hearing Thursday for CIA Director Mike Pompeo to replace former ExxonMobil CEO Rex Tillerson as U.S. Secretary of State. During five hours of testimony, Pompeo faced protests from Code Pink demonstrators who objected to Pompeo's long history of ties to Islamophobic organizations, his climate change denial, and his hawkish views on Syria. Iran and North Korea. Former U.S. Army colonel and retired State Department official Ann Wright briefly disrupted the hearings. This man is no this man is no please, uh, please remove. New Jersey Democratic Senator Cory Booker questioned Pompeo over his opposition to marriage equality and his past comments that gay sex is a, quote, perversion. Do you believe that gay sex is a perversion? Yes or no? Senator, if I, if I can— if Yes or no, sir. Moment, if do you believe that gay moment. sex is a perversion? Because it's, it's what you said here Senator in Mike. one of your speeches. Yes or no, do you believe gay sex is a perversion? Senator, I, I'm going to give you the same answer I just gave you previously. You're going to be Secretary of State of the United States at a time that we have an increase in hate speech and hate actions against Jewish Americans, Muslim Americans, Indian Americans. Uh, hate acts are on the increase in our nation. You're going to be representing this country and their values abroad in nations where gay, and, uh, gay uh, individuals are under untold persecution, untold violence. Uh, your views do matter. President Trump unexpectedly reversed a signature campaign promise Thursday, telling a group of state lawmakers he wants the U.S. to rejoin the massive trade agreement known as Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP. As a candidate, Trump frequently railed against the TPP, calling it a disaster and a horrible deal. The trade agreement has faced years of global public resistance by activists who say free trade deals benefit corporations at the expense of health and environmental regulations. Later in the broadcast, we'll speak with public citizen's Lori Wallach about Trump's reversal on the global trade deal. Former FBI director James Comey compares Donald Trump's presidency to a forest fire that can't be contained. This in an explosive new book due out next Tuesday. In newly published excerpts, A Higher Loyalty, the name of the book, Comey compares President Trump to mafia bosses he once worked to send to prison, writing, quote, "'This president is unethical and untethered to truth and institutional values. His leadership is transactional, ego-driven and about personal loyalty. Comey's book arrives 11 months after Trump fired him, allegedly because Comey refused to quash an investigation into Trump's former national security adviser, Michael Flynn. ABC News reports President Trump has signed off on a presidential pardon for Scooter Libby. He served as chief of staff to former Vice President Dick Cheney in 2011, in 2000, uh, uh, during the Cheney-Bush years. In 2007, Libby was convicted on charges of perjury and obstruction of justice after he lied to FBI agents and a federal grand jury over who blew the cover of CIA agent Valerie Plame, after Plame's husband, Joseph Wilson, criticized the Iraq War. President George W. Bush immediately commuted Libby's 30-month prison sentence for his role in the leak, but did not grant him a full pardon. Trump's pardon of Libby raises the prospect of similar pardons for former Trump campaign officials, including Michael Flynn and Rick Gates, who've secured plea deals after lying to FBI agents carrying out special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation. The Associated Press reports the owner of the National Enquirer paid $30,000 in 2015 to a Dino Sajidin, a former doorman at Trump Tower, to quash a story that Trump fathered a child out of wedlock in the late 80s and that top executives of the Trump Organization knew about it. The AP reports the Enquirer bought exclusive rights to the story, then refused to publish it in a process known as catch and kill. The National Enquirer similarly quashed a story on the eve of the 2016 election about Trump's alleged extramarital affair with former model Karen McDougal. The National Enquirer's parent company's chief executive, David Pecker, is a close personal friend of President Trump. 
The Senate has approved a former coal industry lobbyist to become second in command at the Environmental Protection Agency. Andrew Wheeler, who's worked for nearly a decade on behalf of fossil fuel companies, including the coal company Murray Energy, was approved in a 53 to 45 vote along party lines. Wheeler has also worked as a senior advisor to Republican Senator James Inhofe, a prominent climate change denier. Wheeler's confirmation comes as President Trump is under pressure to fire EPA administrators. Administrator Scott Pruitt over a series of ethics scandals, meaning Wheeler could assume control over the EPA if Pruitt is ousted. In the Gaza Strip, Israeli forces shot and killed a Palestinian man Thursday as he joined a mass protest near Israel's heavily militarized border wall near the town of Khan Yunis. He was at least the 34th Palestinian shot dead by Israeli military since a wave of protests against Israel's occupation began March 30th. Hundreds more have been injured by Israeli bullets. Earlier Thursday, another Palestinian was killed in an Israeli airstrike on Gaza. The latest violence came as as a Palestinian stepped forward to say he was the unarmed man who was shot by Israeli sniper in a gun sight video recorded last December that went viral this week. The video captures the sound of a gunshot, the Palestinian man falling to the ground. And then a voice celebrating in Hebrew and cursing the sniper's victim. Tamar Abu Dhaka says he was shot in the leg without warning as he stood about 200 meters from Israel's fortified border. He told Al Jazeera he posed no threat to Israeli troops. Some young people near the border were lying on the ground. They couldn't get out. So I came to protect them and asked them to go back. Then the Israelis shot me. How am I a danger to the Israelis? We were on our land. We didn't cross. I was in the buffer zone. I had no weapons in my hands. I had nothing. Israel's military has criticized the soldiers who shot Abu Dhaka for cheering, but has defended the shooting itself, with Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman saying the sniper deserves a medal. Meanwhile, employees of the Palestinian Authority in the Gaza Strip say they have not received salaries this month, causing further misery in the already impoverished territory. It's the latest sign a reconciliation agreement is fracturing between the West Bank-based Fatah movement and its Gaza-based rival Hamas. In Colombia, human rights groups are denouncing the assassination of activist Alvaro Pérez in northern Colombia, near the border with Venezuela, this week. He's among an estimated 300 activists and community organizers who've been murdered in Colombia since November 2016, when the historic peace deal was signed between the Colombian government and FARC rebels. In France, police are trying to forcibly evict a group of anti-capitalist activists from their camp in notre dame des landes in western France, where they've been fighting for 10 years against a proposal to build an airport. Over the years, the activists have built homes, a bakery, a brewery, a private radio station, a weekly vegetable market on the land known as the ZAD. Although the French government says it has dropped its plans to build an airport there, the activists say they're resolved to defend the land and community they've built there. The Trump administration's removed Chad from its travel ban after declaring the Central African country's government is sharing intelligence about people it's labeled suspected terrorists. Chad's removal leaves a travel ban in place for citizens from seven other countries, including Somalia, Libya, Iran, Syria, Yemen, North Korea and Venezuela. The Supreme Court scheduled to hear a challenge to the travel ban this spring, with the decision expected in June. Meanwhile, the former U.S. ambassador to Vietnam told Reuters the Trump administration seeking to deport thousands of Vietnamese immigrants, despite a bilateral agreement that should shield most of them. Ambassador Ted Osius says many of the immigrants being targeted were supporters of the U.S.-backed former government of South Vietnam, making them likely targets for persecution if they're deported back home. Osius says a small number of deportations have already happened and that Trump's policy contributed to his decision to resign as U.S. ambassador ambassador to Vietnam last October. Muslim activist, author and TV personality Yasmin Abdelmagid has arrived back in London after she was detained, had her smartphone seized and was deported by U.S. Customs and Border Protection officials after landing in Minneapolis, Minnesota, on Wednesday. Abdelmagid is a Sudanese-born Australian citizen who'd been scheduled to speak at the Penn World Voices Festival in New York at a panel titled The M-Word, No Country for Young Muslim Women.
She says she previously traveled to the U.S. on the same visa that was denied this week. In a statement, PEN America wrote, quote, "...the barriers for international writers and artists visiting the U.S. are growing, impairing the ability of PEN America and other organizations to foster cross-border dialogues that are so essential at this time." The incident came two days after journalist and activist Sean King and members of his family were detained at JFK Airport here in New York by a Customs and Border Patrol agent after returning from a vacation to Egypt. On Twitter, King said the agent asked about his support for the Black Lives Matter movement. He added, quote, "'Family was shook up a bit at first, took us all to a secluded questioning room. What I know is that my Muslim friends deal with this ugliness every single day. Officer had clearly been reading my tweets and knew all about me.'" Unquote. Sean King is a columnist at The Intercept who writes about civil rights, mass incarceration, racial justice and police brutality. In Chicago, a new analysis of hundreds of drinking water samples finds toxic lead is found in the water of nearly 70 percent of homes across Chicago, with three in ten samples exceeding the maximum level allowed by the Food and Drug Administration. The Chicago Tribune reports the contamination is due to lead service lines used throughout the city until Congress banned the practice in 1986. The office of Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel has said it's up to individual homeowners, not the city, to replace lead pipes bringing water to their properties. In sports news, the Seattle Seahawks have postponed a planned tryout for former San Francisco 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick, after Kaepernick declined to promise not to stop kneeling during the playing of the national anthem ahead of the game's next season. Although he's considered one of the league's premier quarterbacks, Kaepernick was not re-signed to the 49ers after the 2016 season, after he sparked a movement against racism and police brutality across the NFL. And new research shows two-thirds of the world's wealth will be owned by the richest 1 percent of people by the year 2030. The report was produced by the British House of Commons Library. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We begin today's show in Syria, where Syrian government forces have taken full control of the Damascus suburb of eastern Ghouta and a major victory for President Bashar al-Assad. The capture of eastern Ghouta followed a Russian broker deal that saw the last remaining rebel fighters granted safe passage to a rebel-held area in northern Syria. Human rights groups estimate some 1,700 civilians were killed in heavy fighting after Syrian forces, backed by Russia, launched an offensive on eastern Ghouta in February. The U.N. says food, water and medicine are in short supply for those left behind. This is U.N. humanitarian adviser Jan Egland. There is, by our, our account, still at least 100,000 people in Douma. Uh, and they need desperately our help. Uh, we have been prevented from going there. Um, we have had very little uh, supplies to there, and now, hopefully, there is finally uh, an agreement between the armed actors. Eastern Ghouta's fall comes as the U.N. Security Council is set to meet an emergency session today over the growing prospect of a war between Russia and the U.S. after President Trump threatened U.S. strikes in response to an alleged chemical weapons attack on Duma last Saturday. This is Russia's U.N. ambassador, Vasily Nibenza. The immediate priority is to avert the danger of war. Uh, you just mentioned that you want to avert the danger of war, the danger of war between the U.S. and Russia. Look, uh, we, we cannot exclude any possibilities, unfortunately, because we saw we saw messages that are coming from Washington. Uh, they were very bellicose. Uh, uh, they know we are there. I hope, uh, I, I, I wish there was a dialogue at, uh, through appropriate channels on this to avert any, any, dangerous, uh, any dangerous development. This comes as President Trump tweeted Wednesday, quote, get ready, Russia, because missiles will be coming nice and new and smart. Then on Thursday, Trump appeared to back off slightly from his aggressive stance, tweeting, never said when an attack on Syria would take place, could be very soon or not so soon at all. 
That last tweet came after Trump missed a self-imposed deadline of 48 hours to announce major decisions on Syria in the wake of an alleged chemical weapons attack on Duma on Saturday. Those comments came as the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, said Russia has evidence the attack was fabricated. French President Emmanuel Macron has said he has proof that Syria's government carried out the attack, and NBC News cited two unnamed U.S. officials who said blood and urine samples taken from a victim and smuggled out of Duma show signs of poisoning from a nerve agent and chlorine gas. On Capitol Hill, Defense Secretary James Mattis said the U.S. is still investigating the attack. This is Mattis being questioned by Hawaii Democratic Congress member Tulsi Gabbard. What would the objective of an attack on Syria be, and how does that serve the interests of the American people? Uh, I don't want to talk about a specific attack that is not yet in the offing, knowing that we, these are decisions. This would be pre-decisional. Again, the president has not made that decision. For more on Syria, we go to Beirut, Lebanon, where we're joined via Democracy Now! video stream by Yazan al Sadi, a Syrian-Canadian writer and researcher. Welcome back to Democracy Now!, Yazan. Your response to all the latest developments in Syria. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, one thing I wanted to say is how surreal this is, even this interview, because, uh, Amy, the first time I was on Democracy Now! was almost a year ago, this exact situation appearing itself. So it just struck me, and I feel I have to say that uh, Karl Marx was right, history repeats, and it was a tragedy, a farce, and it's even more absurd. There's just so much to say. I mean, my first comment I would like to really point out is this weird discussion happening in the U.S. as if an attack on Syria hasn't happened by the U.S. and by others. Let's remind everyone that the U.S. is striking Syria already. You have more than 2,000 soldiers on the ground. There are bases. For me, as a Syrian, I see it as an occupation, just like how I see the Russians are an occupation on the country. So. I just find the whole discussion that's happening is so absurd. And I feel like the hysteria that is being manufactured, in my opinion, by these politicians are just distracting from the core issues. And the core issues, at least to me, is accountability for Syrians. I mean, let's be honest, whether the U.S. strikes Syria and here, I believe people mean the Syrian military or the Syrian regime. How is this going to bring justice? How is this accountability in any way? Because it's not. And even then, what's next? What's the plan here? So I think the biggest issue that is really driving all this is that this is another example of the complete dysfunctionality and failure of the international political and accountability system. That this is what we're witnessing again and again, and we're seeing it in Syria, and we've seen it in so many other places around the world. And it's just, it's become very absurd. And it's become, and it's also, as a human being, I mean, I just am so personally upset as a human, as I can, you know, I have to be empathetic here, because people are dying in the scheme of things men, women, children. They are being killed predominantly by the ones that have the most power, i.e. the regime and its allies, and they are all also being killed and harmed and abused by armed opposition groups who are backed by other superpowers. So that's where we're at. And, and these theater plays, these, these things that happen over an, an alleged chemical attack, and I personally believe it happened, and I believe I have my thoughts and my conclusions on who the culprit are based on the evidence that we all have around. Who it's, do you believe? Really... Who do you believe uh, launched this who attack? I, who, do I think, who do I think launched the attack? Based on the evidence that is around, based on trends, based on history, based on co context, I do think it was the Syrian regime. However, what does this change anything? Because, okay, the OPCW is currently investigating in the country, and they should start on Saturday. And I support that. I believe in an investigation. There has to be some sort of accountability here. I don't believe in a Western invasion and overthrow of the Syrian regime, because I don't think that leads to Syrian de a de a determination. However, how does this change anything? Because the OPCW uh, 
has already said in previous reports that it has linked the Syrian regime to chlorine, a, a chlor attacks, at least three of them. It has also pointed out there are links of ISIS using mustard gas. So what are we arguing here? Are we arguing that chemical weapons are happening in Syria? Well, they are. People are using chemical weapons. They're using chemical agents, whether it's uh, chlorine or anything else. What changes? This doesn't, it ignores the fact that the most deaths are happening through conventional means. Mm. People are dying because of airstrikes, bullets, sieges. So this idea of chemical weapons is also, so, it's absurd. So, Yazan, um, for people who aren't aware, OPCW is the Organization for the Prohibition yeah. of Chemical Weapons. But I wanted to go to Russia's foreign minister rejecting the allegations of the chemical weapons attack in Duma. Doctors, chemical defense specialists, have been to Duma, where chemical weapons were allegedly used, but they found no traces of such use, no casualties or victims of this mythical chemical attack. The West stubbornly refuses to listen to a heap of information. Mm. Um, France says they have evidence that it was the Syrian government, but today the German foreign minister, Heiko Maas, said Western countries must increase pressure on Russia in order to solve the crisis in Syria. We want these people to be held criminally responsible internationally, and there remains a lot to be done. The repeated use of chemical weapons, which is internationally prohibited, cannot come without consequences. You cannot just continue with the daily agenda. This now needs to be discussed with our Western partners. So Germany says they wouldn't get involved with England, with uh, Britain and France and the United States with an attack. And Yazan, your response to the Russians uh, saying it's not them. Yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised that the Russians would take this line, just like I'm not surprised about the Western government's line. I mean, you know, a lot of people point to the example of what happened with Iraq, and I agree that, you know, uh, what happened with Iraq is criminal, and this idea of manufacturing evidence. But there are two things I want to point out. Does this mean that if the U.S. was actually telling the truth, and there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, does this justify the killing of over a million Iraqis and the destruction of Iraq? Is this what people are arguing? Because that's what I'm hearing. Secondly, the position of manufacturing or victim blaming isn't really new. All regimes, whether they are the Russians, the Syrians, the Israelis, the Saudis, the Americans, say the same thing, and they've said the same thing throughout history. A lot of people say, remember Iraq. I also say, true, and I agree, remember Iraq. And also remember things like Guernica, where the fascist government at the time, during the Spanish Civil War, completely denied what happened to Guernica and said it was fabricated and that the uh, uh, anarchists and leftists were bombing and burning themselves. Mm. So this is, this is the situation. Let's all agree, and let's be frank. In They're all lying in many ways to us. Yeah, they it's interesting. You raised Guernica, the famous painting by Pablo Picasso of what happened in Guernica well over 75 years ago. Um, uh, the banner of a, a tapestry of that um, uh, painting, famous painting, that is known around the world, hangs outside the U.N. Security Council. Today, the U.N. Security Council will be meeting on Syria. Um, so what do you think is the solution, Yazan? Uh, you are a Syrian. Um, you have seen your country destroyed. You now, don't you have actually Russian soldiers and U.S. soldiers on the ground in Syria? Yeah, we have everyone on the ground. Uh, it's, a, it's a buffet. Uh, so, what do I think? And I can only, and I'm going to say this very clearly. I am speaking for myself. I'm not representing, you know, Syrians or Syria, because there's a whole wide range of views. What I think, I believe, the solution is accountability. I believe the only way, and the only way we as Syrians could move on and build a sustainable, uh, 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 a sustainable, coherent country is to move for accountability, accountability against every crime inflicted on every Syrian body over the course of seven years. I mean, if the regime—and I know that the regime has committed crimes, they should go—they should be taken to court, and then they should be put in prison. Same thing with the armed opposition, same thing with the Americans, who have devastated places like Raqqa, same thing like uh, the, the Russians, who have devastated places around Syria. They should all be held to account. 
And the only way to do that is not resorting to the international legal political mechanisms because they are failing. They are dysfunctional and they are not made to help us citizens of the world. I believe, or I think I should say, the best thing we can do, me and you and whoever else is listening or watching, is that we need to build a movement. Because the movements today, whether it's Stop the War or the so-called ma mainstream left, they are abysmal and they are failing just as well. Because not only are they not stopping the wars, they are reproducing narratives that are harming people on the ground in the end no different from the neocons and the orientalists and anyone else that are warmongers. The solution, or the idea in my mind, is a better discourse as well. For example, if one says that Assad is a criminal, this does not mean automatically Western intervention. And we shouldn't think that. At the same time, Western intervention cannot be uh, presented as the only solution to dealing with Assad. Neither are correct. Both of them are terrible, and the Syrian people, like many other communities in the world, deserve better discourse and movements. Our bodies are being devastated, just like bodies are being devastated in Iraq and Palestine and in Yemen. And we all need help, and that requires, really, an international mobilization of people, because everything else is horrendous. Don't you think so? Well, Liaz, and let me ask you a last question. President Trump making this decision um, as he is embroiled in various sex scandals, accusations of um, uh, he, the, the special counsel, Robert Mueller, is moving in on him. His lawyers, you know, home and hotel room and offices have been raided. Apparently, there are recordings of his lawyer uh, that have also been taken by the authorities. Now, why raid? this, as you're dealing in uh, Syria with a possible chemical weapons attack, the number of people killed um, over these years, is because that this decision might not actually be made because of what's happening on the ground in Syria, but the internal politics of what's happening here in the United States and wanting to distract attention. That could be certainly so. I mean, whatever Trump does, he can do. But let's not forget that behind Trump is a whole system in place, right? There is—it's not just Trump. We're talking about a political military system within the United States, just like within other countries, that makes these decisions. So I have no faith in that, and I have no faith in Trump. And there's, there's one thing, the, the tweet that Trump had, it was yesterday, where he ended that people should say thank you to America. Uh, you know, I have something to say, and I'm going to say it in Arabic. Kol khara, which basically means, you can tell him, it means thank you. Uh, because in the end, it does, it, what Trump is doing and all this hullabaloo that we also hear from, let's not forget, France and the UK, who are no better and who are embroiled in a lot of crimes and supportive of repressive regimes in the, in, in the region, how can I expect them to save me? They are no different from the Russians, in my opinion. You know, in terms of will they bring me self-determination? Are they actively working to help me and my society and our neighbors? No, they're not. Let's not forget that the three main countries that are gung-ho to start, you know, launching attacks are also, you know, the U.S., the U.K., and France, are also the three main countries that deny the rights of Syrian refugees to enter their lands. So how can I take them seriously? Mm. I cannot. Well, Yazan al Sadi, I want to thank you for being with us, Syrian Canadian writer and researcher speaking to us from Beirut, Lebanon. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, President Trump railed repeatedly against the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It was one of his first acts in office to pull out of any such agreement. He's now saying he wants to rejoin the TPP. We'll speak with Public Citizen's Lori Wallach. Stay with us.
Undefined by Hawa Dafi, here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we turn now to President Trump's unexpected reversal on one of his signature campaign promises. On Thursday, Trump told a group of state lawmakers he wants the U.S. to rejoin a massive trade agreement known as the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP. As a candidate for president, Trump frequently railed against the TPP, calling it a disaster, a horrible deal. This is Trump at a Republican presidential debate in November of 2015. The TPP is a horrible deal. It is a deal that is going to lead to nothing but trouble. It's a deal that was designed for China to come in, as they always do, through the back door and tr totally take advantage of everyone. That was 2015. This is Trump in June 2016, during a campaign rally in Ohio. The Trans-Pacific Partnership is another disaster, done and pushed by special interests, who want to rape our country, just a continuing rape of our country. That's what it is, too. It's a harsh word. It's a rape of our country. Now, here is Trump again, later in 2016, during a debate with his rival Hillary Clinton. NAFTA is the worst trade deal maybe ever signed anywhere, but certainly ever signed in this country. And now you want to approve Trans-Pacific Partnership. You were totally in favor of it. Then you heard what I was saying, how bad it is, and you said, I can't win that debate. But you know that if you did win, you would approve that, and that will be almost as bad as NAFTA. Nothing will ever well, top NAFTA. So, um, President Trump signed an executive order, um, one of his first acts in office, to pull out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So many were, to say the least, surprised on Thursday, when Trump responded to pressure from Republican lawmakers from agricultural states like Iowa, Nebraska, North Dakota, Kansas and Texas, and told them he's directed his economic advisor the former TV host Larry Kudlow and his trade negotiator, Robert Lighthizer, to look into rejoining the TPP. Later in the day, Trump seemed to dial back his comments, tweeting the U.S., quote, would only join TPP if the deal were substantially better than the deal offered to President Obama. We already have bilateral deals with six of the 11 nations in TPP and are working to make a big deal with the biggest of those nations, Japan, who's hit us hard on trade for years, he said. Speaking at a business event in Lima, Peru Thursday, U.S. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross responded to questions about the change in the U.S. position on TPP. The president has made clear in Davos and before Davos that he was open to discussions about TPP. This is simply reinforcing existing views that he had expressed earlier. Meanwhile, 11 nations that represent about a seventh of the world's economy signed the trade pact earlier this year. It's now called the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. This comes as the agreement has also faced years of resistance by fair trade advocates who say it benefits corporations at the expense of health and environmental regulations. For more, we go to Washington, D.C., to speak with Lori Wallach, director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch. We welcome you to Democracy Now! again, Lori. Uh, were you surprised yesterday when you heard the news? From this president, you never know what's going to be said day to day. But obviously, given the role opposition to TPP played in the election, given the fact the president went out of his way to claim that he had done it in, even though, thanks to activist work across the country, the votes weren't there in Congress, and he was— but he had to celebrate it as showing he had delivered a promise. He was very proud of that regardless of whether or not he was responsible for it, the notion that he would flip-flop on that was shocking. But, you know, the bottom line of it is, I think it was just cynical, and he was—they're trying to have it both ways. They were trying to say what the audience of farm state senators and governors wanted to hear. They were at the White House to woodshed the president over the threat of tariffs with China, and they wanted to— they wanted to hear—they're all a bunch of TPP lovers. The guy who was the senator who told the press the president had said this is a guy who's been beating on him over trade forever and is a big fan of TPP, was beating on Bernie Sanders for also being against TPP and NAFTA. And at the same time, the reaction was 
harsh and deserved, because it's outrageous. The AFL-CIO president talked about how getting back into TPP would be enormous a betrayal. It's a terrible agreement. Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, other Democratic members of Congress. I think the only people who are happy were Democratic campaign operatives who were thinking, oh, my goodness, this is gold. I don't believe he actually said it out loud. But in the end, really, I don't think it's likely to happen. Although, the fact they're even open to it shows a lack of principle. But I do think where the real fight is right now is on NAFTA renegotiation. And this kind of pandering on the TPP makes that NAFTA fight even more important. An image on its Facebook page called Rogues Gallery of Major TPP Supporters, otherwise known as the Trump Cabinet. That includes Vice President Mike Pence, Ambassador to China Terry Branstead, Defense Secretary James Mattis, former Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, among others. Can you talk about their position on TPP, as well as others in the administration, including, well, those like the U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer and Trade Advisor Peter Navarro, uh, who don't support, and where you think this is going to go? So, my sense is that there's been an ongoing push by what is a big cabal of TPP supporters in the administration to try and keep the thing alive, to keep the hope alive that somehow the U.S. would try to renegotiate the terms of it and enter, or originally, before the other countries took out some of the most egregious anti-access to medicine stuff the U.S. had put in there and signed it. They had hoped the U.S. might reconsider, et cetera. So there is a huge throng of TPP supporters in the high levels of the Trump administration, no doubt. And by the way, those same folks are totally in love with the status quo of NAFTA. They'd like to turn NAFTA into TPP 2.0. If they can't get TPP through the front door, they'd like to sneak it through the back door of basically injecting TPP into the NAFTA renegotiation. But the good news is the person who is the chief trade negotiator, the cabinet official, the U.S. trade representative, as you said, a guy named Robert Lighthizer, he is strongly against TPP. He's always been against TPP. And he's been the guy in the NAFTA talks who though it seems improbable, he's a conservative Republican, has been basically making the same demands and, by the way, has been in that position for 20 years as a lot of the Democrats, the union's public citizen, which is to say the NAFTA position is the absolute antithesis of the TPP. What the official administration official, uh, official administration position being put forward by the trade representative is get rid of investor state dispute settlement because it out helps outsource jobs and because it undermines domestic laws by letting corporations attack U.S. laws in front of three corporate lawyers, get rid of the ban on buy local and buy American, have stronger rules of origin that now they're suggesting are related to the wage level of the workers making a good so that the trade agreement basically only gives benefits to the products that are made under the rules. They're, they're demanding a sunset clause. Every five years, NAFTA would—the new clause, every five years, NAFTA would have to be reviewed, and only if it was actually doing what it was supposed to could it be continued or take an affirmative vote to continue it. The place on NAFTA where they haven't, by the way, gotten to where they need to, to be is labor standards. They're working on it. There's ways to go. But the point is, what the administration position is on NAFTA is the opposite of what's in the TPP. There is no way to fix the TPP. It's rotten to its core. So the notion that the president would be even open to discussing the thought of potentially maybe in the future negotiating the possibility of total betrayal. Do you think this has to do with what's going on here at home? Again, as I was talking about Syria earlier, wag the dog, completely unpredictable right now as Robert Mueller moves in on President Trump. I think there may be an element of that, but more than anything, I think there is a cabal of farm state legislators, mainly these senators, the guy Ben Sass from Nebraska, who's the guy who broke the story. You know, I think his strategy was a little bit of the hug you to death, instead of screaming at your enemy, because he's in, he's in a trade war with the president over trade. Instead, his idea was, OK, I'm either going to cause the president a lot of mischief or, alternatively, I'm going to try and back him into a corner, saying the thing that he gratuitously said to us, to trying to get us to calm down, which, how many times have you seen any leader, much less Trump, 
basically, because Trump does it all the time, say whatever the audience in the room wants to hear. And the way he posited it was, I want to have my guys look at whether or not we we should relook at that. Let's see if we can get back into that. Let's see, let's let's review that again, guys. Get on that. And then a month later, you can say they looked at it. We have to renegotiate the whole thing, but we'll tell you in a, a year or two if that's doable. It was just a way to pipe those guys down. But the betrayal of even thinking about it, the betrayal to working Americans, those people in Wisconsin and, Mi and in Michigan and in Pennsylvania and Ohio, for whom, many of whom had voted for Obama twice, heard someone clear and loudly say, I'm replacing NAFTA, I'm getting out. I'm out of TPP. And they thought, Ooh, a lot of the rest of him is extremely problematic, but I've got to stop the outsourcing. I can't have my communities gutted of jobs. I can't have these wages so low anymore. They gave it a chance. This is just a slap in the face to all those people to even contemplate it. Laura, so I don't think we. The bottom line is I don't think we have to worry about an immediate or even probably ever Trump administration reemergence into TPP. But I do think. We really have a lot of work to do to make sure the NAFTA renegotiation is the kind of agreement that works for people on the planet and doesn't become a sideways TPP 2.0. Lori Wallach, we want to thank you for being with us, director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch, author of The Rise and Fall of Fast Track Trade Authority. This is Democracy Now! Four evictions every minute in the United States. Stay with us. Band Sing Kane performing here in Democracy Now! To see their full performance, you can go to democracynow.org. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman as we end today's show looking at a new project called the Eviction Lab that looked at more than 80 million eviction records going back to 2000 and revealed in 2016 alone there were nearly four evictions filed every minute. More than 6,300 Americans who are evicted every day. Studies show being thrown out of one's home can lead to a host of other problems, including including poor health, depression, job loss, shattered childhoods. Having an eviction in one's record also makes it far more difficult to find decent housing in the future. Well, now, the Eviction Lab's database is being shared with the public in an interactive website that allows people to better track and understand evictions in their own communities. To learn more, we go to Washington, D.C. We're joined by its founder, Matthew Desmond, who runs Project at Princeton University, where he's professor of sociology. It grew out of his Pulitzer Prize-winning book, Evicted, Poverty and Profit, in the American city. Uh, we welcome you to Democracy Now!, Professor Desmond. Um, can you talk about um, this first national data set of court-ordered evictions in America? Um, you have gone through seven researchers, more than 80 million records. Talk about how many people are being evicted, what are the causes, um, what are the solutions? So, we know in 2016, which is the most recent data we have, because it's comprehensive, there are about 2.3 million people 
that received an eviction judgment. That's a giant number, and let's just try to put that in perspective. That's twice the number of people that get arrested for drugs every year in America, for example. We heard a lot about the opioid crisis last year, and for good reason. There were 63,000 overdose deaths last year. There are about 2.3 million people evicted from their homes. So for every overdose, tragic overdose, there's 36 people uh, that receive an eviction judgment. This is a problem of colossal uh, importance and scope, and it's affecting not only big cities and expensive cities on the coast, but it's, ex it's affecting mid-sized cities and small towns all across America. So if you can talk about um, eviction itself as a cause of poverty. Right. So we're in the middle of a housing crisis. Incomes have flatlined, housing costs have soared, and most people that need housing assistance don't get it. So the majority of poor renting families today are spending at least 50 percent of their income on housing costs. One in four are spending over 70 percent of their income just on rent and utilities. So we've pushed millions of families to the brink of eviction. So what does that do to a family? Well, it causes loss. Families lose not only their homes, but children often lose their schools. You often lose your things, which are piled on the sidewalk or taken by movers. An eviction comes with a, an official mark or a blemish, and that can prevent you from moving into safe housing in a good neighborhood. It can also prevent you from moving into public housing. So after families are evicted and they go through a spell of homelessness, they often relocate into worse housing, into worse neighborhoods. Eviction can actually cause you to lose your job. And for those viewers out there who've been evicted, you know exactly why this is. It's such a hard, consuming event. You can make mistakes at work, lose your footing there. And then there's health effects, like depression. We have a study that shows that moms who get evicted experience higher rates of depression two years later. So you add that all up, and I think we have to conclude that eviction isn't just a cause, condition of poverty, it's a cause of poverty, too. So talk about the numbers, uh, Matthew Desmond. I mean, it is hard to understand. Four every minute? Four evictions are filed every minute in America. So the number of evictions filed in 2016 is equivalent to the number of foreclosure starts in 2009, at the height of the crisis. So it's as if renters are facing foreclosure-level crisis evictions every single year. And this is not just a problem that's in New York or San Francisco or Boston, cities we often talk about as being hotbeds of the affordable housing crisis. If you go to Wilmington, Delaware, one in 13 renter families are evicted every year. If you go to Tucson, Arizona, or uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Albuquerque, New Mexico, you see very high eviction rates. And so it means that the affordable housing crisis is much more deep and spread out than we originally thought it was. So I want to turn to a clip of a demonstration last October organized by the Alliance of Californians for Community Empowerment to protest against Blackstone Group, a massive mm -hmm. private equity firm that's become one of the nation's biggest landlords. Blackstone Group has long owned imitation homes. Right on. They are the ones of the investors backed by the same Wall Street banks That's right. that caused foreclosure crisis. That's right. That's right. Blackstone Group purchased thousands of foreclosed homes at a cheap price and began to rent them. That's out. right. That's right. Crooks. You will hear today that this business model is brutal. Yes. Very brutal. These companies are about raising rent to the maximum that they can. Making money. These companies charge tenants outrageous fees, like a hundred dollars fee to renew your lease. to get away with in maintenance, which means some serious health and safety problems often go unaddressed. So if you could talk about, for example, the Blackstone Group, these kind of organized protests making what often is invisible visible, Matthew Desmond? So when I spent I spent a lot of time with tenants uh, facing eviction, and I've seen dozens and dozens of evictions. And when I would go out with the sheriffs on eviction moves, in 2009, 2010, I'd say, uh, what's happening to you? Who's evicting you? And the tenant would have a very clear answer. You know, Mr. Johnson's evicting me. This is what happened. So when I started going out on eviction moves in 2014, 2015, I'd ask a tenant, you know, what's happening? What, what, what brought you to the situation? 
And their answers were very confused. They say, well, I got a letter from this company, and I sent my check there. They sent it back. I, I, they said my property is owned by another property. So it gave me the impression that property is flipping hands very quickly and maybe being consolidated in fewer hands in some cities. We have uh, ownership information for the eviction records, and we're looking into that right now to give us a better sense of, uh, you know, which properties um, are responsible for the most evictions. Um, are evictions concentrated in housing authorities, for example, or in larger or smaller landlords? These are questions we don't really know yet. A tenant has no right to an attorney in eviction court except in New York City, is that right, which just recently changed its laws? That's right. And this is surprising to a lot of people. You know, if I get arrested in this country for committing a criminal act, I have a right to an attorney if I'm indigent. But no such right exists for families facing eviction. And so, you know, if you go all around the country and you sit in an eviction court, which I would invite your viewers to do if they haven't done, you just see um, hundreds and hundreds of people coming in with zero attorneys and trying to defend themselves. Most tenants who get evicted, they don't show up in court because they know that they can't afford an attorney. One will not be provided for them. And they have to face off often with their landlord's attorney. You know, I have a PhD. I don't know if I would go to eviction court if I had to face off with someone with a, a JD. And so many folks just don't, don't show up. So New York City has decided to change that. Just recently, they passed a right to counsel in housing court. That means every person that's facing eviction in New York City will have a lawyer by their side. I think that's an incredibly effective move. It is investing resources upstream to prevent evictions so we don't face the fallout from evictions downstream in the face of rising uh, homeless shelter costs or rising health care costs, these costs that we currently uh, incur because of the crisis. Are evictions going up? Uh, they're going up some places and down other places. They've remained fairly constant over the last 15 years in America, as far as we can see. They certainly have gone up in a longer perspective. If you read history books, you know, you read accounts of evictions, and they were weird and rare and scandalous, and people used to protest them. And we went from a place where evictions were kind of an odd thing to a place where evictions are transforming the lives of low-income families and communities or being kind of commonplace uh, in, those, in those areas of America. And the number of evictions in red versus blue states, in rural versus city, and the racial connection, if there is one? So the legacy of racial discrimination in America is deeply connected to the eviction crisis. One of our big uh, findings for the data that we've just released is the concentration of evictions in the Southeast, especially in counties that have uh, large numbers of African Americans in them. And I think that this is deeply connected to our legacies of systematically dispossessing African Americans from the land, which is a history that goes from uh, slavery all the way up to the recent subprime crisis. And I think that it's hard to disentangle what we're seeing in the present day from that very troubled past. And the question of red states or blue states or big, st big cities or little ones, it really varies from state to state. And this is one thing that we're trying to get after. A big thing that I heard when I was talking about my book on the road were from service workers and politicians that were working in rural communities and suburban communities saying, this is affecting my city, too, in my community. What do we know about it? Then our answer is, we didn't know much, because we don't have a national database of evictions, which in and of itself is pretty scandalous. I mean, imagine if we didn't know how many Americans had cancer every year, for example. And so what this database does is shine light on a problem that was in the dark, so we could say, look, it is in rural communities and it is in suburban communities, too. Matthew Desmond, I want to thank you for being with us, runs the Eviction Lab at Princeton University, where he's professor of sociology, his Pulitzer Prize-winning book, Evicted, Poverty and Profit in the American City. That does it for our show. Democracy Now!'s Juan Gonzalez will be speaking Saturday in Boulder at 6 p.m. at the First Congregational Church and on Sunday at 2 p.m. in Denver at the Tattered Cover Bookstore. I'll be speaking in Lincoln, Nebraska, on April 20th. You can check our website for details, as well as our link to all the data from the eviction. Lab. Democracy Now! is produced by Mike Burke, Renee Feltz, Dina Guzder, Nermeen Shea, Carla Wells. A very happy birthday to Joe Parker, a landmark birthday here. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us. Happy